All right. Well, hey, good morning. Good to have everybody here today. Thank you for those joining us online. We're going to continue our series that we started last week called It's in the Middle. Now, the purpose of this series for me is I believe many of us are probably in the middle in some season of our life. The middle is where life doesn't necessarily, it's not what it used to look like, but it's not yet what you think it should be like. You understand what I'm talking about when I say that? It's like, like I'm not where I was, but I'm not where I thought I would end up. And so often you find yourself in the middle. Now, what I want to kind of challenge you to understand is the middle is kind of where it all happens. It's where you are prepared. It's where God does some of his best work in the middle of your situation. Now, some of you, you might be like, I don't feel like I'm in the middle right now. I would tell you as a world, we're in the middle of something right now, right? As we are all still facing this this whole thing happening with this pandemic and the unrest in in our countries. Um, And and the thing I want you to, to somewhat keep in mind as we talk about this is the middle is hard, man. It's pretty frustrating because the middle often feels like, like almost like you're living life on a treadmill. You ever thought about that concept before, like living life on a treadmill where you're putting a lot of effort, but you're not seeing many results? And those are the moments when we can get frustrated and want to quit. And so my hope this morning is what we're, what we're talking about will encourage you to keep going. Because I believe most people never reach the potential that they have because they settle for the middle. When the middle is only supposed to be a place of development, never a destination. And so as we get into that this morning, I want to remind you that in this series, we're going through the book of Joshua. Now, Joshua was the leader of the children of Israel after Moses. If you don't know who Moses is, watch Charlton Heston, Ten Commandments, or Prince of Egypt, or something like that, right? Moses was the guy who went to the Pharaoh and said, let my people go, right? And they did. So, now we talked about last week how Moses is, is Joshua is Moses' assistant, and Joshua has had a front row seat to watch everything God did in and through Joshua. However, Moses was also there when Josh, when, excuse me, Joshua was also there when Moses messed up and let his frustration get the best of him. And last week we talked about in the middle, you have to fight frustration because it's probably the place where you're going to become the most frustrated of any season of your life. And so, so as we talked about that in the middle, we saw Moses, he didn't fight the frustration. And because of that, he, he struck the rock instead of speaking to it the way he was supposed to and kind of explained how that kind of messed up the whole picture of who Jesus was. And, and Moses was supposed to set this as an example. And because of that, God said to Moses, you will not take these people into the promised land. Somebody else will take your place and take them in. And so, so we see in, in the book of Joshua that Joshua is in the middle of a transition. So God says to Joshua, you were the assistant. Now it's time for you to take the lead. Anybody ever been put into a position that you didn't necessarily feel qualified to fulfill? And the uncertainty and the uneasiness. I remember when, I, when, when the church voted for me to be their pastor, I was like, what the heck were you guys thinking? Right? I, I kind of didn't think it would happen, to be honest with you. I didn't think my style or who I was was really going to mesh well with where this church was at the time that, that we took it over. And uh, I, I can remember my first day in the, in the office thinking to myself, what have I gotten myself into? Like... I was convinced I was going to tick about 15 people off. There was about 30 people in the church at the time. I was going to make 15 of them mad, and the church would probably set, shut down in a couple months anyway. So, um, so, so it can be an uncertain type of time when you find yourself in the middle, especially when you're stepping into something you're not quite sure. I mean, it's a really cool idea. Like, you ever, you ever think to yourself, man, if when I'm the man, like when I'm in charge, I'm going to do things different. Anybody ever think like that? You know, you're like, oh, when, if I'm in charge, things are going to be different. I mean, you ever say to yourself, when I'm a parent, I ain't doing it like my parents did. 
And next thing you know, you do it just like your parents did, right? Because that's everything you've ever learned to know how to do. So, so anyway, th that's kind of probably what Joshua was going through. He's like, you know, when I'm the man, and now you're the man of a million people, and on a good day, maybe five of them like you. <laughs> I thought it would be cooler than this. And so what I love about this passage of Scripture is we're going to watch Joshua wrestle with the uncertainty of what's to come. For years, Moses was Joshua's assistant. He followed him. In fact, let's just open up our Bibles. The first 10 verses of Joshua is where we're going to go today. Joshua chapter 1. We did this a little bit last week, but just a recap. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses' servant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, then. You and all these people get ready to go across the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. For years, Joshua was Moses' assistant, faithful. Let, let, me, let me encourage you with something. If you're in the middle right now of your situation or your season, learn to be faithful in the small things. In the middle... When you're faithful in the small things, God sees he can promote you to bigger things. And here's the reason why. Usually he has it happen in the middle is because it ain't sexy. It, it, isn't, it isn't celebrated. It, isn't, it feels like cleaning toilets. It feels like vacuuming. It feels like stacking chairs. Those are all the positions I've had in church where uh, at one point my job was to stack chairs, to tear them all down, sweep the floor, set them all back up, to clean toilets. But see, when you're faithful with the small things, God goes, I can trust you with the big things. And that's what we see with Joshua. He was Moses' aide. He was faithful. He was faithful. Every step of the way, he was faithful. When there was this battle that Moses was fighting God said when your arms are up you're gonna win when they go down you're gonna lose so the Bible says that Joshua went up underneath Moses and held his arms up faithful in the little things gets you promoted to the big things but it's typically in the middle where that takes place because it doesn't take faithfulness to be faithful when, when, when you're on the stage that's easy the crowd yells for you, they celebrate you, they like you, you feel the adrenaline that comes from that. But when you can do it, when nobody's looking, and that's what Joshua had learned, in the midst of your middle, I just remind you, be faithful in your small things. Now, as we talk about this, some of you might be like, Pastor, why are we talking about the Old Testament? I mean, that is old and we want the new. Like, that's back then and, and now we have Jesus and so... Things are different. Here's what I want to challenge. Anybody ever think like that? Think it sometimes like, why would we talk so much about the old when we have the new? I want the new covenant, da, 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 da. Here's my challenge for you. Often the old parallels the new. In fact, if you want to get real about it, Jesus only quoted the Old Testament. You going to help me preach, man? Come on up. <laughs> Faithful. All right. So. So the reason I want us to look at that is, is we can, I believe we can learn a lot from history as we look at God's faithfulness throughout the ages. The other thing I think is really cool is uh, when Joshua, so Joshua's name, the Hebrew name that Joshua had is Joshua. The Greek name for Joshua is Jesus. So you, if, you, if you were saying Joshua in the Greek, you would say Jesus. I don't believe there's coincidence in that because, you see, everything the children of Israel experienced when it came to the promise of God came through the hand of Joshua. Everything we experience when it comes to the promises of God comes through our Savior, Jesus. There are parallels that we see throughout this entire story that, that I believe we get to experience as we look at this. Jesus died to deliver us from the bondage of sin, right, once and for all. It was Joshua's job to bring these people into the promised land. Now, here's where I can see some parallels right now. When the children of Israel, they came out of the land of Egypt, how many know that's a good thing? Right? You left bondage. That's good. 
But how many understand that was just the beginning of the journey that wasn't the destination? Wasn't just to set you free. See, often, I think as followers of Jesus, we, we would say, well, pastor, uh, you know, that, that guy was up there preaching and he was just going off. And I felt at the end of the service, I needed to give my heart to Jesus. So I did. And now I'm saved. That's just the beginning of the journey. That's not the destination. That's you've been set free. Why have you been set free? To experience the fullness that God has for you. You are not set free just so you can be like, woohoo, I don't go to hell. Great. Now let's just do the best we can to try and not screw up and uh, make it to heaven. Like that was not the intent. He didn't bring the children of Israel out of Egypt just so they could be not in slavery anymore. He had a promise he had in store for him just like Jesus has a promise for us. That we only realize as we continue to work through the middle. Because the middle is where God develops us to sustain success. It's, it's cool, and I'll, I'll get to this in a minute. It's cool to win, but when you learn how to consistently win, that's life in a whole nother parallel right there, a paradigm. So, so I would say that what we see here is what God wants to show us. Now, one thing we're going to learn this morning from Joshua, last week we talked about you got to fight frustration. With Joshua, what he's going to teach us today is if you're going to make it in the middle, you've got to trust God's promises with certainty. Because in the middle, the promises are not going to look like they're ever going to come to pass. Again, it's like living life on a treadmill, and it's difficult, and it's hard. Joshua uh, chapter 1, verse 3. So he goes, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan. Verse three, he goes, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river and the Euphrates and all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand uh, against you all the days of your life. I, I want to stop there because I want to talk to church people for a minute. If you've been raised in church, anybody in the room ever heard of a, a Jericho march? Buddy know what I'm talking about, right? You ever heard it talked about where it's like, what are we going to do? We're going to walk around our city. Every piece of ground our feet walk on, that's our ground to take. That's not biblical. That's not what God said to Joshua, and that's where we take it from. He said, every place you go, that's yours. But then what did he say? Let me tell you what's yours. From the Hittite country to the Mediterranean to the West, he didn't say go walk in Egypt and that'll be yours too. Right? See, when you step into what God calls you to, you got to make sure you know where he's called you to be because you only have authority in where he's called you. You don't get to walk around any place you want to go and do anything you want to do. If you haven't been called to go there, you don't have the authority to, to, to own that. You, under, all talk, you understand what I'm talking about? I think that's where some of us can get stuck in the middle and God's like, you're only in the middle because you're not thinking right. Because you think you could just step out and do whatever you want. What I called you to do is where I've given you the authority to execute. So don't get it twisted. Don't walk around every place and go, this is our ground to take, if God called you. So know what God called you to do so you can walk in your authority. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in places trying to take things that aren't yours, and it ain't going to go well for you. So, so that's one thing I just want to clear up is it's cool because God's called them, but he told them exactly what he's calling them to. Joshua, you're going to go, and this is where you're going to go, and every piece of ground you walk on inside the territory I've given you, it's yours, and nobody will be able to stand against you. Now, that's pretty cool. But another thing that I, I kind of like about this verse is this. Um, we see uh, three things here. He says, every piece of ground promise you'll take, your territory will extend from the desert. He's like, just as I promise. Right. God promises just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And then he says, and I swore this to your fathers, forefathers. Now, there's going to we're going to see this three thing happen a few times this morning, and it's significant. He says, I promise you, Joshua, he must trust that what God had promised with Moses 
Although he never watched it come to happen, right? Joshua never saw Moses fulfill the promise. Now Joshua must trust God that the promise he gives him, God will fulfill. That that promise was not just for Moses, but it was for him as well. Sometimes it's easy to trust that God would use them, but when we look at ourselves, we're like, how could you use somebody like me? I know me. I'm sure you've got the wrong guy or girl, whichever. This is hard because here's where he's going to struggle. Everything he thought he knew. How would he ever think that the man who took them out of Egypt would not lead them into the promised land? What do you do in your life when the way you thought it was all going to work out isn't working out that way anymore? What do you do when, when the thing you never thought would happen happens? How do you keep going from that place? If you're in a place where you thought life was going to look different than where you're at right now, I would challenge you, most likely, you're in the middle. So what do you do in those moments? Like I said earlier, you've got to learn to trust God's promises with certainty. If he called me, he called me for a purpose and a reason, and he who begun the good work in me will be faithful to complete it. But that ain't easy when you watch what you thought was going to come about not happen. That ain't easy when, when the tragedy that, that has hijacked your life, you never thought in a lifetime you would go through something like that. It's a struggle. And if you're in the middle, you're struggling. But you're going to see this morning that if you're in the middle, you're in a good place. Because it's very often the middle that God uses to prepare you to step into your promise. He doesn't just take you from Egypt to the promised land. Because if he doesn't prepare you in the middle, you won't be able to keep what he's giving you as a promise. You'll have it for a minute and you'll lose it. Because... The development is as much important to God as your destination. All right, we'll just keep going. It's, it's, it's too much. It's too early. <laughs> so here's the struggle, too. Often when we get into those situations where we thought it would work one way and it goes another way, or we never thought that tragedy would happen in our life, we can struggle you say, Pastor, trust God's promises with certainty. How can I even trust him when the situations in my life look the way they look? Here would be my encouragement. Because I trust God's promises are rooted in his character and not my circumstances. Who God is does not change. He is good. He is faithful. And he was with me every step of the way. My circumstances do not, it's not what I put my trust in. Those can ebb and flow. Good things can happen to me and bad things can happen to me. That doesn't change the character of who God is. I'm not trusting in circumstances. That's like trusting in my feelings, right? How many understand some days you feel it and some days you don't? You could be married and wake up one day and go, oh, I feel married and it's wonderful. And how many married people in the room know there's days you wake up and go, I don't feel like being married today. You look over next to you and go, especially to you. Now, if you're smart, that'll never come out your mouth. You'll think it, but you'll never say it. See, no, 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 no. Don't, don't shout me on that one. If you, there was many other places in the sermon to shout. It ain't there. Amen, pastor, that's right. No, 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 shut up. That's bad. Don't do that. I ain't trying to mess your marriage up, and I don't want to have to meet with you and talk about it. So moving on. <sighs> God's promises are rooted in his character and not my circumstances. He goes on to say, no one will be able to stand against you. The land they're being called to take will require them to fight against determined opposition. God, with a snap of his finger, could have removed all the opposition and made it perfect for them to walk in and just take it all. But he's calling the Israelites to partner with him. Why? Possessing the land was going to take effort. 
He needed them to be willing to put the effort. The challenge ahead would not work for those people that were content with going back to the wilderness or even yet going back to Egypt. He said, if you're going to take what I'm giving you, it's going to take effort. It's going to take consistency. It's going to take work. And only those people who are determined will take hold of this. Those who were all right living in the wilderness won't be able to go into this place. Here's something I think God is speaking. Wherever we go after this pandemic as a church, it's going to take effort and it's going to take energy. And it will not be for those who want to go back to what we used to do. If there if God wanted us to stay back where we were at the beginning of 2020, then why did he move us out? Then why did he allow these things to happen? Then why didn't he snap his fingers and make it all go away? I wonder if he's not saying it's going to take effort to step into what I'm calling you to. And if you look at our world today, how many go? There's a whole lot of uncertainty right there. With the stuff that we watched transpire this week, it's like it's going to take effort and it's going to take vision and it's going to take we have a determined adversary that wants to stop us from possessing what God has called us to do. And the only way you're going in is with determination. And that determination comes from when you can trust God's promises with certainty. Oh, he said it and I believe it, not because of what I see. Because of who I know him to be. He doesn't say it and doesn't mean it, right? When he makes the promise, he will fulfill it. God is trying to develop us so we can live this life of success. Now, that that parallels again to our walk with the Lord. Anybody ever wish God would just snap his fingers and take all your struggles away? Would God, could you not just deliver me? I mean, you know, I've got this mouth, and every time I turn around, I open it so big, these 13s fit perfectly inside. Can you just fix that? <laughs> uh, anybody, ever, anybody ever pray that kind of prayer before God, that struggle in my life? All oh, if I could just say a prayer and make it all go away, oh, just deliver me. Here's what I would tell you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have been delivered. The Bible says you were delivered from the bondage of sin and death. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are now a slave to righteousness, meaning that God has come on the inside of you and the Holy Spirit is now moving you toward the things of God. And the only way you don't go towards the things of God is you have to fight against the spirit that now is on the inside of you. You've been delivered. But for you to come out of the bondage that you've been living in, you got to go to the middle. He's going to put you in the wilderness. The wilderness is where he begins to develop you. Because here's what's true. God could snap his fingers and deliver you and set you free. And now that thing you used to struggle with, you don't struggle no more. Guess what? You'll find a new struggle. Because the root of why you struggle is not that thing. It's why you turn to that thing in the first place. You understand what I'm talking about this morning? That thing, that, that addiction, that struggle, that, that, that stronghold in your life, it is not the stronghold why you struggle. You struggle because you use that stronghold to try and make you better. And just because he removes that thing doesn't mean the next thing won't come along because you're still looking for how to make you better. But in the wilderness, when it feels dry and dark and you feel like there's no hope and you don't know where to turn, you learn to turn to God and you start to get him to satisfy you and meet your needs in the dark times, in the hard times. And now it doesn't matter what thing comes your way because nothing else satisfies but him anymore. But you learned that in the wilderness. You didn't learn that Because you went from the the place of bondage into the place of promise. That's why the middle is so important. And some of y'all, you want to skip the middle. You want to just move on. I don't want to struggle. The struggle is part of the process. God wants to use the struggle so you can sustain success. He can deliver you from that thing that you think is the thing that destroys your life. But it ain't the thing. Moving on. I've said it this way. God is trying to develop you so you can live a life in the fullness of all he has for you. And that's what I call sustained success. 
If that is you, then like Joshua, maybe you're in a place right now where you feel like you're in the middle in a scary transition season. Joshua is in that place. And I said it earlier, in the middle, we've got to learn how to trust God's promises with certainty. Sometimes that's easier said than done. As we look at Joshua, we see his struggle. And many of us struggle as well. I want to talk about this morning three things that I think Joshua struggled with that we struggle with. When it comes to trusting God's promises with certainty, the first thing I believe he struggled with was whispers of the past. Anybody ever struggle with the past ever whispering to you? Some of y'all like, man, it don't whisper, it yells. My past is a consistent reminder of how I started but never finished, of how I begin but I don't know how to end, of how I've tried and I've failed, and I've tried and I've failed. And often we don't move forward because of the whispers of the past. The whisper of the past can prevent you from stepping into something new. I think Joshua was struggling in this area because when God speaks to Joshua, he addresses this. If you go to uh, Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, it says it here. He says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to the ancestors to give them. Now, Be strong and courageous. That's the first time he says it. Here's what I believe. I believe verse 6 is reaching back to verse 5. I have to not, I have to wonder, did Joshua have a moment? Maybe he didn't say it, but maybe he thought it. God, I saw what you did with Moses. I mean, but Moses was the man. He's the one that raised his stick and the water parted and we walked through on dry land. Moses is the one where we were starving and we didn't know where the food was going to come from and he prayed and this stuff on the ground appeared like manna and we ate till we were full. Moses was the one that you spoke face to face with like a man does his friend. Moses was the one in Deuteronomy that you said no man has ever lived like Moses. And now you're asking me Moses' assistant to do what Moses couldn't do. I'm scared. I'm not sure I got what it takes to fill those shoes. And God says, as I was with Moses past, so I'll be with you. What you saw me do for Moses, I'm also going to do for you. Let me remind you this morning, my God is no respecter of persons. That means what he does for Pastor Chris isn't because I'm special. Often I believe it's because I've been faithful, right? If he's done it for me, it's not because I've got something special about me. I've been obedient in the places he's called me to be obedient. If you were willing to be obedient in the places he's called you to be obedient, you'll see God do things for you as well that you could not ask, think, or imagine. Just as he's with them, he says, I'll be with you. So so don't worry about it, Moses, because as I was with Joshua, as I was with Moses, and you watched that. In fact, you were the one that was there that watched him come out of the tent of meeting. And the Bible said his, his face shone like the sun to the point where the people said, veil your face, you're hurting our eyes. I'm going to be with you too. So don't worry about God. What, what, what about, what about, what about? Be strong and courageous because I'm the God of your past. Where you've come from, I've redeemed that. And I'm bringing you out of what you've come out of. And I'm taking you to where I called you to. If we're going to continue to trust God with certainty, we have to be willing to not listen to the whispers of the past. What is God calling Joshua to do? See, I think sometimes the struggle is, well, if I just had more self-confidence, right? 
especially now, anybody, like all the infomercials are on full effect. Because 2021 is going to be the best year of your life. Why? Because for $99.99, you're going to buy this book, and it's going to tell you how to believe in yourself and do great things. L let's just be real about this. Self-confidence can kill you. It will kill you. I have no self-confidence. Why? I know me. Anybody else? Like, I know me. I know in the wrong situation certain things that I'll do. I know the way I think. I know how I get angry. I know how I get frustrated. I, I know me. My confidence is not in me. And that's what God's trying to teach Joshua right here. So Joshua, just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. It had nothing to do with Moses. Moses just held up a stick. It was my power that split the sea. Moses just prayed. I answered. Moses didn't have the power I do. And as I was with him and empowered him, I will empower you. I don't need self-confidence. I need a God confidence. It's different. All right? Self-confidence means I got I to gotta do it right. I got to not mess up. I got to be not just not mess up and do it right. I got to do it consistently right. Consistent and Chris have not really worked together in the same sentence often. Ask my mama. She's probably watching right now, and she's amen and real loud. It's not a self-confidence. It's a God confidence. What I have done in my life is because I was told to do it. And he who called me is faithful, right? And Chris ain't faithful. He fails often. But God is faithful. And the Bible says he who called you is faithful to equip you to finish what he called you to do. That's where my confidence comes from. It isn't in Chris. If your confidence is in me, you're in trouble. Find a new church. Because I'm going to hurt your feelings, let you down. I mean, trust me, it ain't going to work out too well. Your confidence shouldn't be in a man. It should be in the man. The one who called you is faithful. Sometimes in the midst of my struggle, in the midst of my sin, I have to remind myself that I am his workmanship. Means he's still working. He's working. Now, I'm doing my best to stay in the middle of the potter's wheel so he can shape and mold me and make me into who I need to be. But the reality is he's doing the work. He's shaping me. He's making me. His Holy Spirit is driving me into the things of God. It is not based on my abilities. And that's what he's trying to tell Joshua. It has nothing to do with you. You don't need self-confidence. You just need to be confident in the one who called you. If you're going to make it through the middle, you got to learn to trust God's promises with certainty. If he called me, if he said he's got a plan for me, then there's purpose in what he's talking about. And I'm going to trust even though, listen, me and God have had some great conversations. I don't know how many times I've told him, you've got the wrong guy. Pick somebody new. I'm not your man. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do this, finish this, complete this, carry this through. And I'm reminded he does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Why I believe he called me? Because I'm the one who knows he's not smart enough to do it. That unless God does it through me, it ain't going to work. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not able enough to do what he's called me to do. Joshua, you don't have to have self-confidence. Be confident in me and what I'm saying. But see, sometimes that's not where it ends. It's not just the whispers of the past that set us back. Often, it's the limitations of the present that will hold me. How am I going to get out of this situation? How am I going to move forward? How are things going to change? Joshua is looking at a group of people that God's calling him to lead. And these people got a proven track record, right? Uh, they, they, their, their record is they doubt often. They're quick to rebellion and they are always questioning God. And right now where Joshua is at, they're on the other side of this great river and it's in the middle of a flood stage. There is no way humanly possible he's going to be able to take the people into this promised land. 
And sometimes when you look at something like that, I'm sure he thought to himself, you know, if Moses was here, he held out the rod and the water parted. But I'm not Moses. I'm not Moses. I've never seen God use me like that. So how am I going to get from here to there? Sometimes it's, it's, it's the limitations of the presence that, the present that will hold you. God, you're calling me to do something, but I'm not sure I have what it takes. Joshua verses chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Again, listen, the second time you're going to hear it. Be strong and courageous and be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. And do not turn from the right or to the left that you may keep, that, excuse me, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Be careful to obey now, present. God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm not Moses. Here's how you're going to do it, Joshua. Do what I say. Obey me right now. I'm the God of your past. I've redeemed that. I'm the God of the present. As I was with Moses, I'm with you right now in the midst of your situation. I'm here. The only way you will prevent me from moving on your behalf is you get into disobedience. So let me tell you how not to move into that place. God is setting Joshua up for success. Joshua, I got good things for you, man. But first, let's set the foundation. So not only you can succeed in this moment, but you can live in sustained success. How many want sustained success, not just succeeding in your moment right now, right? That's what we should all desire. That's the difference between like, I say, how many want to be rich? I don't want rich. I want to know how to hold wealth, right? Rich means you hit the lottery. You, you did all right. Rich means you, you something happened and you made a quick dollar. How to hold wealth means whether circumstances are good or bad, if I lose all my money, if I know how to hold wealth, I'll know how to get it back. I'll know how to, how to generate it again. I'll know how to continually be successful in whatever I do. That's what we need. We want, we want sustained success, right? It's one thing to be like, oh, praise God, I got married, okay? Good, great job. But how many know it's a whole other thing to talk about? I've had a good marriage for 30 years of my life. That's something to talk about. It's one thing to say, oh, finally I got sober. But when you start talking about 30 years of sobriety, that's something to talk about. See, that's sustained success. I don't want to just success today. That's, that's a vapor. That fl- fades in and out. I want to know how to live in success. And that's exactly what God is speaking to Joshua. He's saying, Joshua, I'm going to tell you right now, here's how you live through success. Joshua, it's not enough to read God's word. He says, Joshua, you got to speak his word. Again, if you're going to make it through your middle, you're going to have to learn to trust God's promises with certainty. What are his promises? This book. And this book is more real to me than my own circumstances and my own feelings. Though whatever's happening in my life is true, it's not more true than what this book says. Right? Because I'm not, I'm not dependent on my circumstances or situation. I believe what he said about me. So Joshua, here's how you're going to live this out. You need to speak the word. You need to let it come out your mouth. You need to have it always on your lips. He said, speak it. Make sure it's always on your lip. Then he said, and you got to think about it. So I want you to begin to speak it. And as you speak it, here's what's going to happen. You're going to start thinking about what you're saying. And it's going to get stuck in your head. For those of you who have never spent time in the word of God, when you start to put this book inside you, here's what starts to happen. You don't remember it all the time. Like you're like, oh, pastor, well, da, 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 da. I'm like, I can't pull that from memory. But here's what will happen. I'll be in a situation or a circumstance. Something will happen. And all of a sudden, a verse will pop in my head. And I'll go, oh. I ain't worried about that because he who called me is faithful to accomplish what he called me to do, right? Now it's activated because I've spoken and now I'm thinking about it. And then the last thing he says, and this one is big, he says, and you have to do what God's word says. 
and see that you do everything that is written. It's why in this church we talk about good, way to make it a church on Sunday, way to watch us on Sunday. That's awesome. But talk to me about your other six days. Because that's where you do everything God said. He says if you speak it out of your mouth, if you think about it and you activate it and you live it, you will be successful in all you do. And not only will you be successful, Joshua, you'll be able to sustain your success. It is more dangerous to be successful than it is to fail. Because when you're successful, nobody holds you accountable anymore. When you're doing good, nobody comes and says, how you doing? You got to be more careful with success than you do with failure. Failure says, I need to pay attention. Success can lull you to sleep, especially when you don't understand where the success is coming from. It reminds me, I've had people come to my office sometimes, Pastor Christine, and they want their, their marriage, and they need to talk about marriage because their marriage isn't working anymore. Something happened. It's just not as good as it was. So I asked them the question, well, tell me what was good about it. Oh, well, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, what did you do to make it good? I don't know. Well, then there's nothing we can do for you. Because if we can't reverse engineer it and know what you used to do to make it good, we can't get back to doing what you used to do when it was good to see you back in that situation again. You don't want to just come into success. You don't want it just to work. You want to know what it is you're doing that's made it work so that way if it stops working, you know how to go back and get it to working again. Otherwise, you're at the mercy of circumstances and situations and talk about a rough life. You might as well just ride the waves because they're going to up and down your whole life. Joshua, I'm telling you, here's how you have success your whole life. Speak my word. Speak my promises. So that way, when you stand at the walls of Jericho in a few chapters, and they're so big that the Bible says chariots race on top, and I tell you, I'm going to give you this city, and you're going to take those walls, though you don't have ladders or siege equipment, you're going to be able to know my promises because you've spoken my word, you've thought about my word, and you do whatever I tell you to do. The key to success, do what God tells you to do. Do it. Well, how do I know it's God? Well, can you do it on your own? If so, that's probably not him. He will often call you to do things that you couldn't do in your own strength and ability. But when you do what God's called you to do, and honestly, the way you know it's God is act. Get smart people around you who know God, love you enough to tell you the truth, not what you want to hear. And share with people what you feel like God's saying. Know his word to know if it's God or not. Right. You come to me and you say, Pastor, I'm just I'm just not that by with my marriage. And I think God's calling me to leave, leave her and go with her. I'm going to tell you, you're dumb. That's not God at all. Why? Because his word tells me so. If you read his word, maybe you would have your book. You get your nose in this book and off her and you might be all right. All right moving on. Huh? That's probably nobody in here. That's somebody watching online, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> God's not promising you a life without problems. He is promising you a life of certainty that regardless of what problems you go through, you can have success if you will stand assured on his word. Now, again, Joshua, I'm the God of your past. I've redeemed that and I've brought you from it. And I'm the God of your today. And I'm with you every place you go. And not only am I with you, but I'm here to equip you to accomplish what I called you to do. And then we come to the last thing that many of us struggle with, and that's the uncertainty of the future. Okay, so you're bringing us out of Egypt. You're with us now, and you tell us we're going to go to Canaan. But what's going to happen when we get there? What's that going to be like? How are we going to make it? What's waiting for me? How am I, anybody ever struggle with this? How am I ever going to get out of the situation I created for myself in my past? How is my future ever going to look different? I feel like I'm climbing out of a hole that I can't get out of. And it's a struggle. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you're in the middle of your singleness, right? And, and you're like, and you meet this girl. And I mean, she's kind of nice, 
She got most of her teeth. She can spell Jesus, I think. Not as bad as the last one. How do I know if I'll ever find one better? I mean, I might want to jump on, like, no, don't say that. I might, I might want to take advantage of it. How do you say it right? I, I might want to date this girl because what if nothing better ever comes along? Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me talk to you for a minute. What if is the greatest sermon your enemy has ever preached? What if is the best sermon your enemy has ever preached? How many people have been paralyzed by what if? What, what, what if? What if God fails you? What if you step out and it doesn't work? What if, what if, you, what if you take that leap of faith and it all falls apart? What are you going to do then? Joshua, I'm the God of your past. You need to know that because I brought you out of that situation. I'm the God who's very present with you right now in the moment you're in. And I'm the God that will go into the future and make sure I prepare the way for you to go. And even if other people make bad choices in your life that seem to mess up where you're headed, I'm big enough to even redeem that. I'm with you. I'll even go, you don't have to worry about the what if. What if is not a lack of faith, it's putting your faith in the wrong place. We shouldn't put our faith in the what if, we need to put our faith in the God is. He is able to deliver me, and even if he doesn't, I still ain't going to bow. Because he is. It isn't about what if. See, and, and here's my thing. If we're focusing on the what if, we're not focusing on God's promises. So we get caught up in the uncertainty of the future, the limitations of the present, or the whispers of the past. Anybody this morning in any of these scenarios struggling with your past, wondering about your future, and not sure you have what it takes to carry the weight of what you're in right now, that's what Joshua has preached to us all morning. These are the situations that can find many of us in the middle. And the middle becomes a place where we get stuck. And the middle has never meant to be your destination. It's meant to be your development. Because God cares more about your development than he does about your destination. Because your development is what allows you to walk into sustained success. Oh, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I have come that they might have life and life to the full. Life to the full isn't a life that does this. Life to the full is a life that says no matter what the waves are doing, I ride on top. Because God is. I'm not stuck in the what if. That's what Joshua is trying to help us wrap our heads around this morning. And the reason he preaches it to us is because he lived it. And God was speaking to him this whole time. Joshua 1.9. Third time. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. And do not be afraid. And do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Aha, come on, all day to get to this point. You understand he's the God of my past. All the mistakes, all the junk, the rap sheet, the sea cap, it all gets wiped clean when I say yes to Jesus. I don't have to work from my past. I don't have to make up my past. I don't have to do good and try to be a better person to change my past. He delivered me from my past. He gives me the strength to walk into what's happening right now. And here's the other part. He's the God of my future, so I don't even have to future trip about what's to come. I get to stay present in what's now and keep my eyes open to what God's doing right here because my future is as secure as my right now because God's already ahead of me beyond all the things setting it up for me to walk into what he's called me to do. 
Joshua, you ain't got a trip right now, bro. I take care of your past. I'm with you right now, and I'll be with you every place you go. So be strong and courageous. And don't let anything, any doubt, any frustration, any fear hold you back. I'm with you. The final encouragement repeated in Joshua 1.5 reminds us, I think, too, of the most important thing. And here's the one thing, especially if you're like me and you struggle. I know I'm the only one, but if you might someday be like me and struggle a little bit with consistency, like you, you, you say, oh, I'm going to change. Jeff, come on up. I'm going to change. I'm going to do it different. I ain't going to live like that anymore. I, I pray right now and Jesus take it all away and ah, it's going to be different. And it ain't different. Here's what he says, and I love it. I love it. I love it. Because it's encouragement for someone like me. Be strong and courageous and do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua, it ain't about your ability to keep this word and do it right and always speak it and always think it and always live it. Can I tell you, Joshua, what your success is going to be contingent upon? My presence. If I'm with you, you're coming through. We need to seek his presence more than our own perfection. That's, that's the other church you used to go to that said, come on, drink, dangle the carrot out in front of you and, and really try hard, hard, hard to be a good person. That's a wrap. I ain't a good person. I know Chris apart from Jesus. It ain't good. I ain't trying to be good. I'm trying to be an imitator of the one who called me. I'm not chasing after any carrot. I don't play for a win. I play from the win, right? When he set me free, he set me in right standing with him seated in the heavenly place. I ain't trying to strive for nothing. I'm doing everything I can to reflect the one who called me. And my life changes not because I'm perfect, but because I get in his presence. Joshua, that's what you need more than anything. You need my presence. Because in God's presence is fullness of joy, right? In the presence of the Lord, the enemy has to flee. Why, Why will no one stand before you, Joshua, wherever you go? Because I'm with you. And no enemy can stand before me. More than trying to be a better person this year and trying to change all these behaviors and try to get everything right in your life, go after his presence. Invite his presence to be with you. It's like your mama told you. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Whoever you hang around with, you become like. It's true. Get in his presence. Spend time with him, and you'll be able, like Joshua, to understand that it is time for you to be strong and courageous because he's the God of your past, the God of your today, and the God of your tomorrow. He's with you, and it's not hard then to trust God's promises with certainty. I'll leave you with something to kind of run around in your head all week long. And I'm going to leave you with this one because many of you have heard it before. Anytime you ever go to a funeral or some kind of religious event, you're going you're gonna to hear it, right? This verse is often used. It's, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Did, did you hear what I said? Yea, though I walk through if you're in the middle right now you're walking through the only issue is maybe you built a tent and thought well this is as good as it's ever going to be i might as well just learn to live here get up it's a place to develop you not a place for you to dwell God never intended you to dwell in the valley of the shadow of death. He's allowed you to walk through it because often in the darkness he shines much brighter and often in the darkness, the real motives of our heart gets revealed. And often in the darkness is where we learn how to have our sustained success. But can I just remind you, you're walking through. 
And if you're dwelling in that place, get up, because that's not the destination point that God has for you. He's still got a promised land for you. He's just preparing you to live into the promise. And keep in mind, you don't fear, not because you're good, because he's with you. And I love the part that goes, my rod and my staff, they'll comfort you. Ha, you don't know what that is. Oh, the rod is nice. It's the little hook of the shepherd's staff that kind of gently puts it around your neck and goes, come on, little sheep, come over here. That's not where you're supposed to go. That's not good. Come here. We like that. But there's a staff, too. That's the other end of the shepherd's staff. The hook is nice. The staff is the, what the shepherd would use to break the sheep's legs because it wouldn't stop wandering. So he'd break its legs and he'd put it up on his shoulders and he'd carry it because he understood if he didn't break his legs, that little sheep would wander off the edge of a cliff and die. And he loved him so much he wasn't going to let that happen. For those of you who love the pretty pictures of Jesus carrying sheep, he just broke its legs. I've totally messed up your theology for the rest of your life, but that's real. And that's what love is. That's why I won't get stuck in that place because he's going to gently remind me or break my legs and carry me if he has to. But see, he who began the good work in me will be faithful to complete it. He's going to complete it. I don't have to get frustrated with my situation because he's going to finish the work. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you that from thousands of years ago, Joshua could come into our church and preach to us this morning and let us know that you're the God of my past, you're the God of my today, and you're the God of my tomorrow. He can encourage me that, that I'm, not, I'm not dwelling in this difficult place right now. The middle is not a place where it's going to end. It's actually where it begins. It's preparing me to enter the promise. But Heavenly Father, I want to pray for those people in the room right now that are struggling with their middle. Maybe it's their past. Maybe it feels like every time they try to move forward, they find themselves going three or four or five steps back. And, and some are at the point of going, I don't know it's worth struggling anymore because I'm never going to get there. God, set me free. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, I would hear the Lord say to you, I already did. What you're wrestling with is your imagination and not reality. I've redeemed you from your past. I've set you free from the curse of sin and death. You are no longer a slave, but you got to stop thinking like a slave. That's why you keep going back. Because you still got a slave mindset. You've been set free. Oh, the enemy would love to tell you you're not free. But who I set free is free indeed. Jesus died once and once was enough to set you free. God would say, man, it's time to walk in your today. And even if it doesn't feel like progress, you just keep moving forward. You allow my Holy Spirit to move you into the things that I've called you to do. Maybe some of you, your struggle is, God, what about tomorrow? Tomorrow. And this isn't a mean God who goes, don't worry about it, I got it. Hear him this morning as he says, son and daughter, I love you. I love you so much and I have great plans for you. And right now, I'm working out your tomorrow. But what I've called you to do right now is going to prepare you to step into your tomorrow. So you don't find yourself back on the cycle, but you find yourself moving into the good things that I have in store for you. So let's focus on right now and let me handle tomorrow. I've got it and I've got you. And just as I brought you from where I brought you from, yeah, you're not where you want to be yet, but you're not done yet. I'm still working. Don't stop the process. Don't let, don't, don't let the enemy steal your joy. Don't let him steal your opportunity that's in front of you right now. 
Man, I pray for those people in this room right now that are stuck somewhere in that place. Lord God, I ask that they would hear your voice. They would hear your heart. They would hear how much you love them and saying, hey, I want to move you into what I've got for you. But just learn to be faithful in the middle right now. Learn to stand in the midst of the situation you're in right now. And I'll bring you into what I got for you. And I'll tell you this with certainty. No eye has seen The Bible would say it. No ear has heard and no mind can conceive the good things that God has in store for those who love him. It's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. There's so many good things in store for you. Be faithful in your moment right now. So when the time to walk into the place of promise is ready, you're able to walk into that place. Jesus, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that you are God and I am not. And I thank you for the perfect plans that you have for every person in this place. Man, before I close this down today, you might be here and say, Pastor, I've never... I've never given my heart to Jesus. I've never said yes to God. I've heard you talk about it. I've heard you say like there's this, this Holy Spirit, which is part of the God, the Trinity, inside of you, like pushing you to do the right things, to be the, the to follow God. Like I don't have that and I want that. That's the coolest part. That's free. That's, that's being delivered from Egypt. That's where you don't have to be a slave anymore. The Bible says it's real simple. All you do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord. He is the Lord. And believe in your heart. Believe that, that, that he came to this earth as a man and he died on a cross to save us from all our sins and invite him to come into your life. God, I give my life over to you. I've done life on my terms and I've tried to make it work and it didn't work. So I'm turning my will and my desire and my everything over to you right now. And I'm asking you to guide me, to lead me, to teach me, to instruct me. The Bible says if you do that, your past, all the stuff is canceled. God removes every sin, not just the sin of your yesterday, but the sin of your today and the sin you'll commit tomorrow. What Jesus does, he does for us once and for all. That doesn't mean we ain't got to live right and we ain't got to try and do our best to imitate him. And Sorry, I shouldn't even use those wording. That doesn't mean we don't allow the Holy Spirit to move us into what God has called us to do. It isn't about me trying or doing my best. That's never going to be enough. It means I read his word, I speak it, I think about it, and I live it. Man, but if that's you and you made that choice, I believe God has a plan and a purpose, and we want to know about it. So before you leave today, would you stop at the booth back there and just let somebody know if there's any way we can help you walk this out? God bless you guys. Go ahead, open your eyes. Jeff's going to sing that song again probably, Um, I'm guessing, or I just put him on the spot, so there it is. Or he's calling Sarah in right now. Sarah, the Lord has need of you. Come in. I think, honestly, I think that song would be perfect to leave, right? But think about it now. Not from a place of maybe before we're thinking about all the stuff you watched on news this week and like, oh, yes, we need Jesus. You know what? They do need Jesus. But you know who Jesus is on this earth? You. Your representation. Why do I want to imitate him? Because the world needs to see him. Nor I don't claim to be him. Okay, don't don't mess that up. No Kool-Aid passing out here. No, no, I ain't Jesus. I'm just doing my best to that when they look at me, hopefully they see him. And that should be the goal for every one of us. That way the world goes, and we need Jesus. He's here. He showed up because you showed up. You're going to work tomorrow. Jesus is showing up, right? Because what is the success? What is the main thing, Joshua? My presence will be with you. What happens when you take his presence wherever you go? Things change. How many need something to change in your life? His presence. 